All right, rather than go through the rest of uh, the items, we'll just go immediately to yeah. uh, the discussion with the city manager. I gotta admit, I'm a little nervous with all these high powered people. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Well, that helps. <laughs> just like you were, just like everyone else. Yeah, right, that's true. Um, thank you for coming. For sure. sure. And we do appreciate it. And this is two years in a row. And last year about this time, I think it was a little later, but uh, it was a very good discussion last year. Hopefully, there'll be a third discussion next year. Um, before I introduce all the uh, board members, I just want to say that they, uh, you've got a good board here. You really have a good board. I think Ronnie would agree, Jeff would agree. Um, it's especially the new members uh, are a good supplement to what they had already. So they work very hard. And uh, I've been on a lot of boards, and I tell you, this is one of the best boards that we've ever had in terms of the energy they put into it, the thoughts they put into it. And sometimes they don't agree with me, which kind of, you know. It's good for you, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good, that's good. So we've got some recommendations today. Some are hard, some are soft, uh, some are simple, some are complicated, some are cheap, some are expensive, and so, appreciate the chance for you to listen to these recommendations and if we can get them implemented this year that would be great if not this year or next year or if not next year the year after that but these are the kinds of things that we these are directions that we think that the city council and the senior center should go so with that I will introduce the board members I think you know you know, Brandy and Ronnie and Jeff and yeah, I'm good down here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Start <laughs> off with somebody you can't remember the name of. I'm Catherine Onaka. Okay. All right, and you know those folks. And Christina, I'm Christina Pacheco. I'm the director for human services. Okay, and Roman, they don't. And Marsha Martin and Ann Coxley and uh, Art. Quintana. <laughs> Quintanas and John Diggins and uh, Sheila Conroy, got it right. Eric Brack, uh, Lonnie Gilly. <laughs> On a lot of occasions in other venues. <laughs> and who are you? My name is Anna Mullen, is part of the public. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, what's your name? Mike. Oh, Mike. Mike, okay. And uh, uh, Arlene Zortman, and I'm Dave Brenna. Everybody knows Brandy, but also Brandy. So, uh, with that, the first uh, two people out of the shoot are going to be Lonnie and Sheila. I don't know how you want to handle this, but. Well, I, I would like Lonnie to take the lead because I've been somewhat MIA on the okay. last couple of yeah. months. Yeah. So, most of this is. Yeah, you were in London for a couple of weeks, cool things. Okay. Um, and most of these recommendations, although we've agreed on them and had some discussion yeah. ahead of time, okay. it's how they so, Okay, yeah. well, Lonnie, you want to take us through your recommendations? Okay. My area of interest is housing, and so my recommendations have to do with housing. Before you get started, I forgot to, I forgot to say one thing. We tried something a little different this year. I think it's different anyway. We, we focused on three things this last year. One of them is housing, and the other one is tra uh, transportation, and then outreach. Now, Ronnie and Sheila have been working on housing most of the year, and um, Art has been working on outreach most of the year. We had another person, but uh, she left us. And uh, let's see, who did I miss? The uh, transportation has been handled by Arlene Zorkman here. And uh, I just wanted to say that they put in a huge amount of work. Okay. Before you go on, uh, have you ever read anything called Maria? You know, I'm sorry? Maria. Maria? Oh, Maria. Not here. Cortez Garcia. I just didn't know if somebody, if she called you. I don't know. She didn't call okay. me. Just curious. No, I don't know. She's our remaining board member. It's not here today. Okay. Uh, would it be useful to have Harold do a little introduction before we start into 
I think questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we just went through the um, council retreat not long ago, and um, you know the one thing I'll say about the conversations of the council is um, we, we spent a lot of time a couple of years ago, Marcia, mm -hmm. talking about core services and, and what we need to do. Yeah, Probably the last three retreats we've touched on it, and you know the one thing that. Um, I would say starting out is when we look at the council's work plan and the council's vision, it hasn't, it really didn't shift, uh, which is a good thing because uh, the items that they have on the work plan are pretty significant. Um, so when you think about it, um, we built the graphic and you may have seen it. But, Can you write it higher? Huh? Can you write it higher? It's tall. <laughs> it's tall. That's the problem. Oh, okay. I'll so, just move. That'll be easier. So right here, um, think of core services. And, and when we talk about core services, you know, we're really talking about those things that are foundational to munic municipalities and what they do. You know, streets, signals, all of those things. And one of the things that we've talked about with the council is when you look at core versus aspirational, you can do all the aspirational work you want. But at the end of the day, if your core services fail, then what we see in communities is they don't really care about what you've done that's aspirational because uh, the foundation of your system is shuttering. And you, you know, I, I mentioned the council, Flint, Michigan, Jackson, Mississippi. I can rattle off all these cities that have had such fundamental challenges but nobody cares about the other stuff. They just want what they need in, in their daily lives. And so the primary focus that we're going to have is core services. One of the things that we talked about with council is really the capacity of the organization and what we can do. So when we evaluate the size of our organization versus organizations of a similar size, um, we, we have probably the fewest amount of staff when we compare ourselves to Fort Collins, Boulder, and a lot of the, the larger cities. And that's by design. I mean, that's intentional because we're trying to be as efficient and effective as we have. So when we think about our capacity, a lot of our capacity is eaten up in the daily work. We've been adding positions in certain areas so that we can get better. Then the next tier uh, that the council said is important is equity, safety, and sustainability. Thank you. And this is probably more so you see the graphics. And again, the council started doing work and the organization started doing work looking at these components and, and saying, you know, what's the next thing we need to do to really support our community? And then this is where it gets, starts aligning with what you all are saying. So when you look at this, and I'm not an artist, so I'm not, Depending on who you're talking to, they'll say, well, this looks like a house. I think Councilmember Martin said it looks like a rocket ship. And so whatever you think about, think about that kind of analogy and what we're doing. And so they said, in this case, we're going to put housing. We're going to put early child care. And we're going to put transportation. And so if you use the housing analogy, what that really is saying is this is our foundation, this is the subfloor, and this is the, these are our low bearing walls in terms of what we're trying to do. And then you go over here and it's um, places and amenities. And I think the thing that's really coming out of everything that the council's put together in terms of what they really see as their core services is really all of these things touch so many different areas. So when you think about housing, it touches all demographics in our community. It touches economic development, it touches the service industry. It, it just really is just all encompassing of what it impact can be impacts to the community. Child care is very similar in the sense that it touches economic development, it touches the ability to employ people, you name it, and transportation. So when you look at this, 
every one of these things is really touching the breadth and the depth of our community. Now, outside of it, you know, you can look at it as a cloud, this is climate action. So everything that we do within the scope of what the council's work plan is, is really surrounded by climate action and, and, and how we're approaching the future. And again, I would argue that it's all encompassing in everything that we do. So in terms of what we're focusing on operationally uh, from an organizational perspective is, is really in this, in addition to some other components. And so if you use the house analogy, you know, envision that you're looking at this house and with the mountains in the backdrop and you're seeing the clouds and all these components are here, if you're using the rocket ship analogy. Just uh, move the cloud lower. Yeah, <laughs> imagine that the rocket ship is launching through. And, and, and that's everything that's about our community. So council stuck to this. And, and so we're just continuing to remain focused on it. And in this, you'll see a lot of things. So, you know, that's what we're working on. Obviously housing, uh, on the housing side, that's coming into two different areas. So one area, uh, you all know that the uh, city and one of our board members is here, Arlene. And it doesn't surprise me that Arlene's doing transportation because we've worked with Arlene on transportation on the housing authority. She worked. She's worked in transportation about thirty years. Yeah. So, you know, the city took over operations of the housing authority. So I'm the interim executive director, um, and I do air quotes because in year three, four, <laughs> year four. Um, but I think we're, we've been moving in the right direction. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what's going on right now in housing, uh, Lonnie, you know, you're in the middle of it right now. So we're, we were able to um, move forward with the resyndication of Village Place Apartments, which is just down the street. Village on Main. Village on Main. <laughs> we, keep, we all keep doing this. Uh, Village on Main, you know, part of that was important to us because when the housing authority took that over, um, they basically just used the financing mechanism to buy it. They didn't make any improvements to it. So we were like 15 years beyond the point of needing to make adjustments. So we're in the middle of that right now. Um, at the same time, we're about to, I think we are getting um, temporary certificates of occupancy or certificates of occupancy on the Christman Apartments, where we partnered with MGL, um, and that's not an age-restricted unit. Uh, and that's gonna be opening in the next, probably next few months. I think they're maybe, they're leasing up now, but it'll be fully open in probably a month. Uh, we're in design on um, the Senate Hover, which is, um, again, not an age-restricted property. It's a family property, which will have one, two, three, and four bedroom units in it. Um, and then we're trying to get early child care in there, but we're having to raise money to do that. Um, and then we're working on a couple of other, um, on, the, on the separate, on the other side of housing, on the city side. Um, when we look at our affordable and attainable housing fund, the council just approved a development project for 185 for sale units which are all going to be either affordable or attainable housing. So when you think about that, think about price points probably in the neighborhood from 300,000 to, it could be up to 600,000 because believe it or not, $600,000 is an attainable house for mm -hmm. someone at about 115% AMI. Uh, market rate homes right now are going at about six, I think the last number I had was about 653,000. And you know, when you think about how that number is generated, a lot of it is drawn down because some of our older homes that need a lot of work, they're selling for four. So imagine what, for some of the houses are selling for, we're seeing eight, nine, a million dollars for a home that you may have purchased for $400,000. Arlene and I talk about this all the time. So that's in play. And then we're working on a couple of <clears throat> other housing projects. You know, part of why you're not seeing as much, um, age, as many age restricted units being brought forward is because when we did our housing needs analysis, what we really found is probably the greatest need in our community right now 
it is for family housing. Um, and so historically, the housing authority hasn't focused on that. So we're trying to add affordable family housing into the mix as we look forward. On our age-restricted units, we're seeing some interesting things. Most of those, when you look at the tax credit projects, we're having a hard time filling units in the 60% AMI level uh, because either people either don't have the income to fit into it or it's, it, it's a weird thing. So they either make too much money and they want a 60% AMI unit or they don't make enough money and they can't afford the 60% AMI unit. So we're seeing some interesting things occur in the market. So a lot of work on housing um, and transportation. Uh, what I will say is we're, we're at the precipice of really seeing something significant for our community related to how we approach transportation. So um, we've been doing a lot of work with RTD. Um, you know, Councilmember Martin and I talked a lot about you know how this is moving forward, and and so we, you know I was having conversations with the uh, CEO of RTD. Um, Phil was having conversations, and we were able to work with them, and they created a, an innovative transportation grant a year ago, two years ago, and then we had to go through the application process. So we got we received four hundred approximately four hundred and forty five thousand dollars this year. More than any other city. More than any other city. Um, we were probably the closest to getting fully funded on that. And then they also awarded money over the next two years. So it's going to be 375 and 375. That was just in the paper a couple days ago. Right. So we're going to issue a, we're, we're getting out an RFP for microtransit in this month. And, and really, what, think of a hybrid of Uber and Lyft. And so it is, it, it operates like Uber and Lyft, but it's really more community wide. And, and the cost basis is different. And it, it's, it's a ride share, it's a on demand, but the, the point of microtransit is to integrate into your bus system so that you can make your bus system more efficient in terms of how it operates and you can actually get across town in a in a reasonable period of time. So if you get on the bus now and you try to get from North Main to uh, Southwest Longmont at Village of the Peaks, it could take anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour. The companies that we've talked to, they actually created the software that most transit systems use. But what it does is it starts evaluating where your shopping is, where your people live, where your employment is, where the people live, and they focus on reducing that time period. So we talked to a company that was working across the United States, and one example is in Montgomery, Alabama. The employment base was um, 30 minutes from where people live um, via public transit. They actually were able to reduce that to eight to 10 minutes, utilizing microtransit and the bus system. Um, we are also in the process of starting to talk to other municipalities surrounding us. I've had a meeting with Bart Berthin, um, and really we're going, we're going to intentionally build, uh, bid microtransit out in a way that other municipalities can piggyback on top of our contract so that we can create a broader system. And um, the other day, um, and uh, so that's in play. I'm gonna tie it back in a second. So. On transportation, you may all have seen that the governor's office released a white paper regarding rail, and the proposal on the rail side is that basically within seven years, they're gonna have an operational rail system, and, and they looked at how they take the existing RTD funding to make that happen. So generally, they'll move money out of, that we've been paying. Mm -hmm. We're gonna move money out of the FASA account that we've been paying the proposal is to move it into another account with a, another governmental entity that's tying everything together. Then they'll take the ongoing funding from that. They're going to leverage CDOT money. Um, they're aggressively going to go after federal funds because um, that really ends in November. So there's a, a window to get the money allocated to it. 
Um, it's on their website, and if you read the white paper, there's a link that'll take you to, the, or if you read the press release, there's a link that'll take you to the white paper. Um, so we're, we're actively involved in conversations with them regarding how this works. Uh, and um, and so that that then starts tying into microtransit. And I was told the other day that in, in a meeting, um, one of the um, higher level officials in CDOT was actually talking about Longmont and, and the microtransit um, RFP that we're going to put out in connection to rail. So the rail dis discussion is changing things dramatically, which also puts some different pressures on us internally in that um, the first domain transit station we're acquiring property <clears throat> we're building a public private partnership with the owner of the, or the individual that owns other properties in the area but knowing where the state's coming from on rail we're going to have to really um, get focused on the transit station um, because that needs to be ready if they pull the trigger <coughs> on the flight paper um, and we're also looking at some other opportunities for transit-oriented development in the south area of Maine, which ties into something that may impact you all here, is um, we just put the Coffin Street project out for bid. We're going to know once the bid comes in, we're going to have some more information, but that's going to start uh, the reconstruction of Kaufman from um, Mike. And we're going to be moving this way. So Kaufman's going to be under construction, and that's going to be a a multi, multi that's going to be our first true engagement in the concepts of Vision Zero and some other things. So it's going to be a true multimodal <coughs> road that'll be bike, head, car, and bus. So it'll have a dedicated bus lane in the middle, and that'll move the buses off of uh, Main Street in that section once it's built, and that's going to tie into bus rapid transit. <coughs> so the primary bus station will be slid down to South Main um, as we're looking at this. So at the first at the transit station, um, there's going to be a lot of work going on downtown. Um, you know, I mentioned the transit station that's a little bit further off. Um, Kaufman Street's more imminent. Uh, hopefully, the hotel starts under construction across the street from our office within the next month or so. We're we're running into some title issues that council had to help us with. So, you know, a lot of work in this area is probably going to be the most significant transformation of downtown that, that we've seen in the history of our community. And what's really interesting is if you look at the plans that the downtown had dating back to the late 70s and 80s, they've been wanting to do this. Um, and it's now starting to happen. Um, and then early child care, you know, Christina and her group has really worked with this one. Uh, in terms of, you know, how to how are we bridging that gap? And so I'll, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, Christina can answer questions. And then really places and amenities, and you see us start tying all of the primary work and core services into places and amenities. So, um, you know, you may all have seen in the newspaper where we're actually um, able to have conversations regarding the redevelopment of the sugar mill. Um, I will tell you, for us, that is incredibly important right now because of some of the public health and safety issues that we're seeing in our community that are really generated from the Sugar Mill site. Um, we've had fires there, lots of fires, or a few fires recently. Um, you know, we're not hiding from the fact that we almost had a police officer that was severely injured. Um, there was a fire on an encampment in the lime piles on the south side of 119. And we actually had drone footage. And as he was walking by, a propane tank exploded. And you could see stuff flying by him. Not long after that, we had another fire. Basically, what we did is we positioned our fire department and just said, we're going to surround it and take a defensive posture because we were not going to send them in there because it was too dangerous. And so we're working many different angles on this. Um, you know, what I've said to the people we're talking to on it is, it's a marathon, not a sprint, when you have a project this large, this large, and um, and it's probably an ultimate marathon. 
So I was like, get ready to buy multiple pair of shoes for this because it's not going to be, it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to take time. Um, so that's generally kind of what's going on. Um, I could probably talk for six more hours. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about budget. We do expect this budget year um, to be challenging for us. Um, the residential ratios were again shifted by the state, which does impact uh, the revenue coming in to um, our organization and what we can do. Um, so we're gonna be watching that pretty close. It's also a non-appraisal year, which means that uh, typically the growth that we're going to see is going to be primarily from sales tax. Uh, there is a conversation where individuals have been approaching the city council regarding grocery tax and eliminating that. And last night, Jim Golden presented to them. You know, in general, um, at this point, we're comfortable in saying that it, it would have about a $14 million impact to the general fund budget, which um, is significant. And in that 14 million, there's some bond issues that are interesting to deal with uh, because we've issued bonds and pledged the sales tax rate. Um, our legal counsel has said to us that the city council cannot um, on their own appear or reduce the grocery tax. Um, for the 2% that's allocated to the general fund and the 0.2%, on the open space fund because that'll that will violate our bond covenants, um, which leaves the open space tax and the public safety tax. And, and I'm going to talk more in depth when we go to council again because that will create significant issues for us because on the public safety tax, about 83% of the public safety fund is people, um, which will require significant adjustments um, as we're going to approach it. Street tax, right? Not open space. Street tax, correct. Street tax is the one that doesn't have any debt on it. And so then when we think about street repair and things like that, Division Zero, obviously we'll change how we approach it. I was in a conversation uh, yesterday with the city managers of Loveland, Fort Collins, and Estes, and it, that happened in Loveland. And it was a $13.4 million impact. Um, <laughs> they're going to have to make significant cuts to their operational budget and and typically that is a very narrow area that you can cut. So I say that because part of what we're thinking about is if for some reason there's a, a, a citizen initiative in this and it gets on the ballot, you know, we're going to have to be pretty careful going into this budget process and what we look at, but, you know, I can say unequivocally that um, whatever form that takes, you know, it, it will be significant, the impacts will be significant, and we're going to have to make some hard decisions and recommendations to the council because um, when we think about what is purely sales tax funded, so let's say we lose it in the public safety fund, then the question becomes, well, do we just reduce the public safety officers that we have at play? Probably not, because the growth that we're seeing in our community is really demanding more of that. So then we have to then dive into the general fund and look at the general fund and you can go to the council that says we can't reduce firefighters and police officers based on our call volume. Here's where we can really look at cutting. And as we talked about with council, there's not a lot of areas that are purely sales tax driven. Um, you know, for example, I gave the example to the council. My position, while it's in the general fund, probably about 40 ish percent, maybe a little, maybe thinking of my breakdown of my salary, but let's say 30 to 40 percent is actually paid for by the electric fund, the water fund, the wastewater fund, the sanitation fund, the open space fund, the airport fund, and the broadband fund. So, generally, Think about, so if you cut my position, for every dollar you cut, you only get 50 cents to make a dent in it. And there's a lot of areas within the organization where that really is in play. Almost all of our internal services look like that. 
So what it means is you're you're now limited just to a few things. And Jim gave the list to the council, and you know it's senior services, it's youth services, it's the library, um, it's health and human service fund. Um, I can't remember all of them, but those are really the only ones that are just purely sales tax driven. So as, as we're having to make recommendations, we're going to have to look at core services and things like that to come back to it. So I say that because when you have that kind of conversation and you have a municipality adjacent to you that's going through it, um, we've got to be mindful of it. And, and it will change. I mean, if something like that were to happen, um, it, it definitely will change how we're going to operate. Um, and so we're, we're thinking about that. Uh, pressures, budgetary, I mean, we're still seeing um, compensation to, um, as a significant issue for us. Um, it just seems like every year uh, the markets are adjusting rapidly. Uh, I think we're fully into seeing people retiring out and competition um, increasing for positions. We were at the LEDP Economic Summit last week, and you know, there was a, a demographer there that basically, if everyone that was on unemployment got a job, we would still have more jobs open than there are applicants. And so what that does is, as you can see, that still pushes compensation up because everybody's competing for those positions and the more specialized it gets, the higher the level of the competition. Um, we're seeing the job market loosen up in some areas and we're seeing it remain tight or get tighter in others. Specifically where we're seeing the job market um, <clears throat> become really tight is in areas in the public facing positions. And that is not unique to Longmont. We're seeing it across the nation. And as I talk to many of my colleagues and I look at what ICMA is presenting is there are fewer and fewer people um, that are wanting to go um, into government in a public facing position just because of the nature of the conversations that are occurring and, and the type of interaction. And so ICMA, which is International City Managers Association, are recruiting a lot of us to try to get more people to come into to government. We're actively engaging with the school district, Front Range, and other places because we think we're gonna to need to, to build a pipeline internally and where we train our own because the market's just not supplying it, but that'll be a budget issue to look at as we're moving forward. Um, Inflation stabilizing a little bit, but we're still seeing increases. Utilities are, are driving us crazy. I had a meeting with Jeff yesterday about recreation and the impact of utilities. Um, and then the supply chains are still problems for us. Um, we wanted to shift um, our police cars to plug-in hybrids. Um, can't get them. And in some cases, Ford came out and said, well, we're canceling all the orders. And, uh, and then we're like, well, who else is doing it? Well, they're all doing it. And, um, and so, you know, we're having to work through those issues. Uh, on the electric side, you know, we're seeing things uh, like transformers that we used to be able to get in three months. It's taking a year. Tran uh, the significant um, transformers and substations used to take us a year. It's taking us three years now to get those on order. <coughs> you name it we're still seeing the supply chain issues. And so all of those are budget pressures that we're gonna have coming into to this budget year. We think it's probably gonna be one of the hardest we've dealt with. So, with that ray of sunshine, <laughs> it's all manageable. I mean, and I think we can work through it. We just have to be really diligent as we're working through it, looking at it, you know, taking incremental approaches over time to figure out where do we want to be and how can we incrementally step into it versus getting from point A to Z immediately. We may have to hit 10 different letters in the alphabet to get to where we're going, but um, I think it's all doable. It's just, um, we have to be really managed and calculated as we're working through this process. So with that, 
I don't think you have questions. I don't think it's got a question. A couple of, actually a couple of questions. One of the things that was mentioned in the paper in regard to this front range passenger rail proposal mm -hmm. was that there's a possibility they're going to go to the voters and ask them for a 0.8% increase in the sales and lease tax. Is that, would that even pass? I don't know, based on what happened last year and going forward, is that gonna happen this year? So I don't know, that's really the state driving that. And, and I think a lot of that's going to be dependent on what happens on what is Northwest Rail. So if you read that, it's not RTD that's going to be providing the service, it's going to be Amtrak that provides the service. And so as, as you kind of work through it, basically it is to take the existing funding and then federal funding to, to build um, city to city rail service from at a minimum Denver to Longmont. Um, I think in that they alluded to Denver and Fort Collins, and, and that's what's leveraging the federal dollars. And so what that really means from front range passenger rail is that when they looked at, well, here's the tax increase, it would have been bigger, but they're offsetting it with these other funds coming in. The taxing district um, is pretty big. So um, think of basically the northern border to the southern end of El Paso County, where all of those areas will have to vote on it. So it's kind of hard to understand what it's going to be because, you know, it's, it's not Boulder County specific. We do know that there's a lot of traffic, both, you know, if I look at Boulder, if I look at Longmont, there's people moving in constantly to work, there's people going out to work, there's people that drive from South Denver to Fort Collins to work and so understanding the impact of those individuals, I think could really maybe allow that to pass because um, you're talking about something that would significantly change somebody's life in terms of the amount of time that they're spending on the road. And, and so I think people may look at it in a different way, but it's hard to say. Um, and I think we're just gonna have to watch and see what their plans are. It needs to be communicated, you know, so that people understand mm -hmm. what what happens. Okay. So, if you want to give me your list, you know. okay. <laughs> um, we spoke to a lot of different areas and a lot of different organizations. Oh, how much time do you have? Okay. Well, I'll Okay. I spoke to a lot of different areas, um, going from affordable housing to areas that uh, people who were interested in having the, um, the what are the rules? Um, code? Yes, changed. No, the zoning changed so mm -hmm. that they can do things with their own property or they can stay in houses that they already live in. Main focus for housing is everybody says we need more affordable housing development. And that's just, you know, including older adults and veterans. Um, have you ever considered rent control? Well, it's that an is an issue in long run. That is not something that I, that is not in my world. Okay. So that is in the city council's world. That's more of a policy directive um, in, in what they're looking at. Until recently, um, cities were prohibited from doing that, um, and I believe that was a Telluride decision that did that. Um, so I, w I wish I could answer that, but that's not a question for me. That's, that's okay. I just wanted to yeah. put it out there because I don't know that we've ever discussed it, and so I wanted to see where we could, you know, where it sat, sat as far as a possibility. If I could just put my nose in, since I'm sure. the target of those requests, uh, yeah, it has been. Uh, uh, prohibited by the state for the whole time I've been on council until the Telluride decision. And uh, despite that, you know, we, we had a, to do quite a dance just to get our current inclusionary zoning ordinance through the legal department because they thought that it was tiptoeing right up to the line of preempted rent control statutes at the state level. Okay. And 
we really haven't studied yet whether what the state did just made us safe with our inclusionary zoning ordinance, right. or whether it would even whether it would allow uh, rent stabilized apartments like you know New York has or something like that. But what I will say is that every property owner, every time there's even a sniff of that word being used, right. says, "I'm going to get out of the business. I'm going to get out of the state. I'm going to you know." So the, the opposition is extremely strong. Well, and, and I mean, I, I think understanding the financial issues because, you know, what I can say to everyone unequivocally is that the only reason that afford capital A affordable housing works is because of the tax credits, and the tax credits are really what's allowing that to be held because you intentionally take losses in, the, in your pro forma um, and they get tax credits from it. You know, I think the thing that I would say to council that they would need to be mindful on that is we need units. And so if you put things in place that could potentially discourage people from building units, then, I mean, have you really made an impact on this? Because you need supply. And, you know, it, on, especially in the rental market, it, it is pretty clear that supply does moderate the rental prices in the community and, and we, we've seen that happen um, so I think there you know the unintended consequences are going to be we've got to really pay attention to that because well it may be and the reason New York gets to do it is because the rental rates are so high and so you know something like rent control may work in Boulder but it may not work here because when you look at the market rates for rentals they're, we're significantly lower than anyone else in Boulder County in terms of our- We are rent. here in Longmont? Yeah. Oh, wow. and, and in some cases, what we're finding is because of that, it's inhibiting the development of more higher end apartments because they can't get the rates that they, they need for that product. And so what, we, what we've seen in our housing analysis is that people that can actually afford more apartment because they're not available in our community are buying down below to a lower AMI. So, you know, let's say you have a 30 something that is in IT and they're making $300,000 a year, the type of apartment that they would normally buy isn't necessarily readily available here. So they're buying down into 120% AMI apartments. Um, and so all of those things we have to think about. Also, New York is absolutely emphatically at build out where we are not. Correct. really recommend that obviously that you support the um, request for funding for the senior center. The senior center does a huge amount of services for the city. Um, they do things like home and community based services, transportation, wellness, socialization opportunities, nutrition services, and financial assistance. So we advise the request for funding from the senior center be approved because basically by 2030 we're going to be at seniors are going to be 20 percent of the population so and that's just going to continue to grow um, the veterans are in need of, of housing um, I spoke to a woman there who brought up a good idea to have cohabitation or um, a few people living in the same house and that way they can be kind of given services together. When people visit for um, health services and things like that, they can take care of residents at the same time. When they deliver food, they could deliver Meals on Wheels, could deliver four people food in one shop. So the idea of having a place that is um, shared rent, less amount, and where it would be a community for people, and mm -hmm. they'd have people to lean on and to support each other. So that was one of the recommendations that we got. 
Um, a big one was to have an assisted living facility that takes Medicaid and Medicare. And I know that's in your pipeline um, somewhere. Yeah. And I know that it's something that you are looking at. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's just people who really need extra help and can't get it. Mm -hmm. They can no longer live on their own, um, but they can't really find a place they can afford. And so they're kind of stuck in the middle. <clears throat> um, um, can I jump in real quick on that one? Absolutely. So the council in their goal setting session in terms of giving us a number of projects that um, six and five years, which almost three quarters there, under five years. Um, one of the things early that they, we all talked about was uh, affordable assisted living. So what I can say to you all is what we're seeing in our age restricted affordable housing is that because there's a lack of affordable assisted living, we're seeing people that the only thing they can afford is the independent living, which is creating issues I mean, across the board for us. Uh, we are engaging in conversations with different folks in terms of what they do. Um, and you hit it. Medicaid is the big issue on that. And, and finding somebody that has the ability and the knowledge to build Medicaid and move through that. Um, we're actually really looking to the Midwest uh, in terms of that affordable assisted living model because they tend to be... Um, you know, the Midwest is really probably out front of everyone nationally really? uh, in terms of that affordable assisted living. So places like Chicago, um, Minneapolis, um, Cincinnati, um, they, they are doing some interesting things uh, to do it. Uh, and, and that's really something that we're going to need the state to be part of as well, because it's the state systems in addition to the federal systems. Um, and then I've also had conversations recently locally with Holden Properties about this concept. And so it's on our radar. I just think it is so complicated that it's going to take us a little bit longer to go through it. Okay. Also, I wanted to, I don't know if everybody here knows it, but everything the LHA has done in the last maybe 10 years, building wise, most of it has been for seniors. Right. So. You know, if people are wondering why the new projects are not age restricted anymore, it's because they have not done projects for um, a wide range of age group in a long time. You know, it's really been more of seniors that they focused on. So, but the but the ones that are coming up that are not age restricted, seniors are also available to move there. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just one of many people who will be applying for those apartments, so they can still get apartments. There. Um, we we advise that Safe Lots program be brought back, be brought back, um, and be supported and funded by the city in addition to private organizations. What would you think of that? So I'm going to dodge again because it's really a um, a council, council uh, policy issue. You know, what we've told council is, I mean, there, there, there's an interesting point in that um, when, you, when you have limited resources, and, and part of the Safe Life pro pro Project was that they didn't, I mean, they didn't get continued funding from the state. I mean, that's really what uh, impacted it. You know, when we think about it and we look at the housing projects that we're build, bringing forward to the council, there's there's a policy decision they're gonna to have to make. So for pretty much every affordable housing project, whether from the affordable housing fund, you know, we're putting in anywhere from, I'm thinking, what, a million and a half to three million in terms of managing the gap, even with tax credits. And so, you know, if you start pulling down that money for other things, then it could impact what you're able to do in terms of constructing units. And, and so, you know, that is something that they'll have to have a policy conversation on, but we're gonna have to work them through the impacts of the funding and what that looks like uh, to the overall affordable housing for the capital A. Okay. Um, and we recommend that zoning laws be reviewed to allow duplex and higher density housing. So what's interesting is 
In terms of our code, our, our land development code is actually in pretty good shape for that. And we found that actually out through the 185 units that we were talking about, in that there are different ways you can do it. Um, in most cases, where the challenge comes in is actually in the design standards. And so we've been working to review the design standards, um, and that's really engineering. And so think about, you need X amount of setback from a gas line, X amount of setback from a water line, X amount of setback, and, and it's the engineering that starts making that a challenge. Mm -hmm. The housing project that, that I talked about on the 185 units, we've actually, we're testing the design standard changes that we're going to be bringing to the city council and the way we're able to do it and this is why i say the code is not an impediment is we're actually going in with a planned unit development or a pud process which allows us to adjust those design standards and and here's what we found um, the council's policy on sustainability it says you know let's not use gas but what we found is, A, including gas lines in that housing development added about $1.5 to $1.7 million to the construction costs. It actually blew up everything that you're talking about in terms of setbacks that doesn't allow you to achieve the density because Excel says, here's our rule, here's our setbacks, and for in, this is what you're going to do. So we made the decision on that project to not, it's going to be all electric. And it's gonna and it's gonna hit that because a it hits our sustainability goals, but b let's just start compacting our setbacks. And so internally, we're working with our power group to say, yeah, you don't need a five foot setback. Um, and water and how you load those into alleys. And and so we know that for the most part, we're able to accommodate that. And they're going through review this week. And once they do, and we can test it, we're going to be bringing the design standards to council to change it for a more urban-based design code. And what that will mean is if you're building urban-based projects, you can use this code. If you're going to build a suburban-based project, so think of every new neighborhood that's been built probably within the last 20 years, here's your code. And we're not going to let them mix the two because if you allow for an urban-based standard and all you're getting is a suburban-based product, you're not maximizing the use of land and getting the density you need to bring housing prices down. Is that consistent with what we've been saying? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, Carol, can I ask a question? As we are building the, the housing projects, a lot of folks don't have their backyard to play in. So there could be a bigger impact to the park system. Right. My, I guess my question is, when it comes to resource services that senior services does and recreation, is it would it be a good plan for us to try to go into the housing uh, facilities or is it best to try to get people to our facilities so they, they get some time away? You know, as we've thought about this, I mean, so think about market rate apartments that are being built and what they're including. So all of the new ones include really robust gym facilities um, and they include other amenities. I think what we're finding from the housing authority's perspective is that assuming that people can just make it to where you are, it is, is, I think, an assumption that when, we, when I look historically is not a good assumption because when we think about accessibility to transportation and we think about financial means to do it, it doesn't work. And so, you know, and you've heard me say this organizationally, I think we need to, via our center of excellence model, start figuring out how do we look at going to other places where the infrastructure is built because that reduces the capital cost that you have coming in and then you're only doing dealing with incremental you know operational costs that is easier to step into and the more that we can capitalize on existing facilities the more we can expand our services across the board from the city 
geographically into all areas of our community. And, and we're testing that out actually right now at the suites. So we're partnering with the Recovery Cafe because we know one of the challenges that we have in permanent supportive housing is um, recovery. And when I say recovery, I'm talking about alcohol, I'm talking about drugs, I'm talking about mental health recovery. And, you know, I've learned something from them that we're all in some form of recovery <laughs> on something. And we know that's an impediment to housing. And so we are, we're partnering with the Recovery Cafe where they're actually going on site now to the suites. And when we're seeing that it's already having a tangible difference in, in terms of how they live with each other. And if this works, we're gonna to talk to them about doing it potentially at other housing authority properties. And so, A, it's more cost effective. B, you're getting to where people need to be. We know that many of these places, they don't have cars, and even the younger population. And so the more we can reach out, I think it's probably the financially prudent decision to make. Can I add something there? I think a lot of the social issues that we run into within the housing sites could also be helped by helping people get out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's a stewing that happens if right. you just stay inside your building all day. Exactly. The yeah. people around you are staying inside the building all day. There's a lot of benefit to trying to get people out in the community. Well, and credit to Arlene and the council because it was Arlene's idea on you know, the, the partnership with you. And so that, that's a big part of that too. So it's, it's the mix. What we're also thinking about is though, how do we bring people from the community to those locations? Which is a different look at that. But, you know, I, in the neighborhood I live, the neighborhood we live in is immediately adjacent to a market rate multifamily unit and four affordable housing units. And how do we create partnerships with the neighborhood so the neighborhood engages as well, because I think it's both of those things we have to do. Okay, um, we only have two left. Um, we advise low cost housing options that are co-sponsored by LHJ, BCHA, and the city of Longmont, like this spoke, continue to be considered and planned for. And I'm sure that's something you, know, you, you think of. Um, and outside of housing, the board advising that um, advises that more daycare programs for older adults um, be developed. And we're not sure how to do that. And what we'd like to know is there something we could do as a board to help that or look into that or whatever. Um, that would be a nice, that would be something we'd be interested in finding out. What do you, what level of daycare? So, let me give you context. So, Good. when we think of that is, you know, I've lost the term. Yeah, memory care. You're right, memory care. So, you have, you know, you have everything from mild memory care facilities to mid-level memory care facilities to high-level memory care, you know, in that point, because caregivers also need a respite. Mm -hmm. And so, what are you all talking about in terms of that? You know, I would have to bring that back to the board, but I think what we spoke about was similar to what goes on down at first, but third and um, Terry at the church. At a place, yeah. yeah. It's called a day place, yeah. and it, it serves folks with all different kinds of health issues, not just memory needs, but there is a limit on if you need a certain level of assistance with functioning, that they just don't have the staffing to provide that, that level of care. Um, so it's not so much about the level of memory need as so much their physical capacity and can they do things like use the restroom on their own. So I think, Carol, the ideal uh, thing would be from, say, 8 to 5 or something like that so that all of the kids who are working can get a, a parent who needs extra care um, to a facility they still can maintain the job and, and do it that way. 
and the socialization at those places at daycare facilities is, is great for the the adults too so i think that that would be ideal but of course you know they have drop-ins during the day probably but mm -hmm. that would be the ideal thing would be to help the <clears throat> children right now who are part of that sandwich generation get to take care of their parents i think we're going to be coming back with that one okay, okay. Yeah. and that's it that's it for housing all right Arlene, are you ready? I am ready. Mine's going to be really short. You've talked about a lot of this this morning. So microtransit, um, and we have I've talked about this in, in the meeting here before as to how it's going and what it's going to do. So I don't know what the RFP says. So my questions are, are we going to be able to, with the microtransit to be able to transport somebody that's handicapped, either with a walker or with a wheelchair? because um, that would be, you know, a definite concern. And I know that it hasn't really been decided yet as to whether or not that's going to be door to door. Um, in cases of somebody who has a difficult time getting to where the location would be, would they be able to be door to door? Or I think we're going to miss a lot of people that way. And it needs to be for everybody, um, not just seniors, but of course we're advocating for seniors, but, um, and then the price. I know that it's not going to be free, right. um, and it needs to be a reasonable price. When you start looking at people with low incomes, that can they afford it? And can, would we be able to take families? Would we be able to take a mother with her children to get them to school or get them to daycare or something like that? So I, I don't know what what your RFP is going to say, but are those things that are being considered? Um, those are all things we're thinking about. The RFP process on this is going to be a little different. So we are engaging, um, over the last two years, we've started testing out the concept of, um, from a purchasing standpoint, the best value approach. And the best value approach is different. Um, and I don't wanna to get too wonky on you all right now, but there was um, a professor uh, out of Arizona State that started evaluating governmental bids. What they found in governmental bids is that they typically were coming in anywhere from four to six percent higher than what they were seeing in, on the private side. And they were seeing that the process typically took a year to get through the product from bid to the contracting and so on and so forth. So what they developed is this approach that actually meets federal procurement standards. And the intent is is to compress everything. And, and part of it is, part, why is it more expensive for government bids? Because typically what they found is that governments micromanage the contract to the point that the companies that were bidding on it were not sending in their A team. They typically were sending in their C team. And the reason they did it is because they weren't going to send their most productive employees into a situation that they were going to be micromanaged and they sent their employees in that needed the micromanagement. They've tested this out in different places and the data is very clear that it's a difference. And, and I will tell you, we've seen it locally. So we did our eight and five parks. Um, the process, we cut the time down by 50% at least. And in cutting it down by 50%, we actually ran into a situation where they started work before we signed on the contract. It's a good thing to see. We're still learning through it. But what you do is you go into the process and you go, here's your problem. Here's our problem. So the bid itself is like less than five pages. And it's essentially a problem statement saying, here's what we're doing. They then have to provide you, I believe it's under 10 pages the solution to the problem, and then they come in and you only allow one person to talk to you. And they tell you how you're going to solve it, how they're going to solve it, and then you make the decision. And so what you're really doing is flipping the process on its head and allowing the experts who have done this nationally to come in and go, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to utilize that approach in this. Um, we've done it in other areas and it, it, it works. Uh, I think for us internally, it's a struggle because it is something that like 95% of our organization is not used to, and it's a bit scary, um, but we know it works. And so they will answer a lot of the questions that you're talking about in terms of all of those issues. 
based on what they've done in other communities and how it approaches. So it will be ADA accessible. It may be that, see, they're going to integrate into the broader system. So they're going to integrate in and connect with RTV, Accessoride. They're going to integrate in with VIA. They're going to integrate with all these other groups. And so from a customer perspective, what we're hoping is that if you call them and they have to get Accessoride to come in, you're not sort of in limbo going, are they going to be here? They're going to be facilitating that because it may be that Accessoride is the better fit for the particular customer. But they're going to be communicating with that. So, yes, those are all on our list. We're going to see what they tell us okay. and how they solve it. I like the idea of the the way that you're doing contracts, because I've been on the other end where we've had 20, 30 pages of, of instructions of, you know, this, 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 and this, that's crazy. Okay. Um, so the front range passenger rail, when we talked about the 8%, and I've, I've brought that up here because I think that's an excellent way for people to be able to get down to the airport. If their ticket that they buy here will also work to get them on the uh, train in Denver to get to the airport. So it's, you know, if we can keep that kind of, everything will work, or if their ticket from here will get them to Denver or even Fort Collins or Pueblo or Cheyenne if they eventually get there. And Cheyenne's engaging in the conversation though. Yeah, then will that work for a 24 hour a day or how, how will that work? So those, those are all kind of things that we're, we're concerned about that. I think for seniors, it's excellent. You get on that thing, you can go if you have a doctor's appointment in Denver. So those are things that we're definitely uh, talking about. And if I can answer one question, one of the things that we're looking at is really an income-based fee structure, um, and and operationally, probably going, how the heck do you do that? Well, we're in the process. So we brought in Salesforce, which is. And we brought it into our utilities, which is probably the premier, um, what do they call it? Customer Relation Management, CRM, yeah. software. Um, most Fortune 100 companies utilize it in terms of managing their customer base. So we're bringing that in. And what we're hoping to do with that is to integrate, it's not recreate systems, but mine the data in a middleware concept so that as people are in different structures, we can connect them so that then if Jeff wants to create a, a program in recreation that's based on income, instead of having people fill stuff out again, we can automatically do it. And, and we're getting ready to test that out with our housing authority folks um, related to actually grocery tax um, conversation and has nothing to do with what people said. We actually ran into this before then where we knew I had a meeting with somebody who was an HCD voucher recipient, older adult. And they came into the meeting because their life changed and we had to negotiate some agreements that we had and they had a copy of the CARES program. And I was like, why are we making people who we know meet the qualifications apply for something. Um, and so right now we're working on, if you're an HCD recipient, if you're living in affordable housing, we're gonna port that data over so those individuals are automatically qualified for the grocery tax exemption. I had a conversation with El Comite that said, look, if you have the data that tells me people qualify, how do we work with you so you port that over? Um, once we figure our side out on the housing internally, we're gonna reach out to Boulder County because we know they have voucher recipients here. And we think in a very short period of time, we're gonna dramatically increase the number of people that receive the grocery tax exemption. But it was literally me being in a meeting going, why are we doing this? And, and so we can use the same process to your point of how we set the rate structures for the transportation system because we'll have the data set to then make that easy an easier transition. So uh, one of the other things that we are looking at or 
are advocating for is that uh, Firestone Longmont Mobility Hub. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an excellent uh, idea over there, but how do we get there? So can this, is the city looking at either RTD or some of our local bus services here to be able to get people out there, seniors out there, so they can take the uh, bus down to Denver or Fort Collins or wherever, or how are we doing, or how are we doing that? So that's our... So it's an interesting question because Southwest Weld County is not in the RTD system. So there is an operational boundary that is established in terms of where RTD can operate. Um, our thought process is in the microtransit program, once we figure it out and get it running, um, is to start talking to places like Fred Frederick and Firestone to um, have them participate in the program to a certain extent to bridge that gap. Um, because there become some interesting dilemmas. I mean, if you think about it, you know where Smuckers is? That area that they're developing just on the, um, to the east of it, that's actually Firestone. And so understanding the jurisdiction's responsibility and, and how that works in terms of people from here to there, you know, that's something we're going to talk about. The question really is, can we bring people from there here? And that could be a pricey decision to say, and the microtransit operator will have to be the one that does it, that says, we'll go out and pick you up, but you may pay two, three times the amount that a resident of Longmont would pay because we're subsidizing not only is RTD putting money into it, we're putting money in from our transportation fund. So how you allow people from a different jurisdiction to take advantage of the subsidy that we're putting in locally is the heart of that question. Okay, so Firestone is actually looking at you guys to test how the microtransit is going to work so that they can kind of... I don't know about Firestone, I know that First is looking at us and some other places because I've had conversations. We're going to engage in that once we get the RFP done to see if there's an interest in. I'm talking to some folks who live in Firestone to maybe help facilitate that conversation. So one of the other things that we talked about was a street crosswalk lights. And I noticed this morning, because usually when I'm out driving around, I kind of watch to see when does the light change for the person who's trying to walk across. And so I, I mean, I saw somebody trying to get across when the light changed and said it's free, you know, you can go. And it was, it was somebody on a bicycle. At the same time, the person was turning. So, I mean, it's an education of the traffic, you know, the people and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think where I see a nice situation is where traffic is stopped, the people get the option to go across first for like about three or four seconds, and then the light comes on and says, 20, whatever. Um, I'd like to see that continue at some of the, you know, pretty much throughout the city, um, if that's possible. I know it has to do with computers and everything else, but. So there's actually an answer to that question. Um, so the, the signal system that we've had in place for years um, is not as adaptive as we would want and um, probably should have been replaced 15, 20 years ago. Um, it wasn't, we had a new traffic engineer come in. And, and so part of what we're doing organizationally is assessing our infrastructure to understand, you know, kind of that core service piece, which this falls into. And what we realized was um, as part of a conversation with the DDA in downtown, all of those issues were being brought up. So we started evaluating it. At the same time, our system started failing on us. And so we started doing a, a financial analysis on it. And if we were to replace that system with in the, the, the one we had, it would have been millions of dollars. But we, there was another more uh, modern system that was less expensive. So we are actually in the process right now of changing out signal lights. Um, along main, so we've identified some areas that are priority to change those signal lights out. And when it's implemented, that they're more adaptive. So you're gonna see more cameras there. So they're actually gonna be able to provide us the traffic counts in terms of you know, the number of bikes we have, the number of pedestrians we have. Um, but it's also gonna monitor, be able to monitor the intersection. So if you're walking across the intersection and 
you know, I've seen it in crossing in front of by the pump house. I mean, by the time you're three quarters of the way, you're out of time. This this will actually monitor it, and it, it'll have the ability to extend the amount of time on the crosswalk based on whether or not people are actually still in the intersection. And then we just received a significant grant. Did they pay to talk to council about that? I can't remember. A significant grant from the state to actually replace all of our majority of our signals in the community. And once that's done, then it'll start looking a lot different than how the signal system works now. And, um, you know, it's more AI based and how it works. And it also gives us the ability to come in and, and manage a system at different times of the day if, you know, there's something happening. Um, Part of the challenge we also have are trains, um, and so because that'll muck up the signal system in the blink of an eye. And um, Becky's actually working with a group that has that's going to have an app. They, they're testing this that people can get the app to figure out where the trains are blocking intersections. And so what we're thinking about doing is how do we integrate that data set into this other system so that we're more in tune to what's going on. And then sort of the last thing, you, and I know you've heard me talk about this before, is the grocery shopping is excellent that we're doing at the facilities. Um, and going back to the socialization thing and getting people out, I would love to see us be able to update that or get you know different things going on so that they could attend. If they wanted to go to the farmer's market, they could go. They could go downtown when you guys have things going on. Um, you know, they could just do things that they're not able to do right now because they just don't have transportation to do it. And yes, it's great for the housing people, but I, there's also other places here in town that people are not getting out and around. So I think it would be, how, how can we help that? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. You know, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, when you look at, at a lot of assisted living facilities, they have transportation. They have transportation. And I think, how would you all engage with some of those assisted living facilities to encourage them to do it? Because, you know, because if, if they have it, you know, my question that, that, you know, I saw this every day is, you know, why, are, why aren't they doing that? Because obviously people are paying for that service and then the, and the charges and then you know, the, the, you know, I, I call it a death by a thousand cuts. You know, I've said to the council on a regular basis, you know, government can't solve everything because we just don't have enough resources to do it. And the more we can start hitting and getting different people to partner in this, the more able we're going to be to really deal with those areas where someone lives in an assisted living facility, but they don't have that transportation. And we can really get targeted as to where we're doing it. And that helps us manage the cost a little bit. Um, but I think, I, would, I mean, that's one thing that you all could really help us with um, because we just don't have the capacity to engage in those conversations. Um, I think it's something, at least on the housing authority side, we're continuing to look at the more financially solvent we become, I think the more robust the services are going to be that we can provide. Um, we're pretty close. Um, I presented to the council on the budget and I think our general fund budget for the housing authority, um, we're now able to project it out over time. I think you saw it. I think we were at 1.5 million before, which is like bare bones. We're now at 3 million. And so as we look at other projects and building that, and as these new projects come in and are able to pay more in to administrative fees into the general fund, then I think we start getting some more capacity financially. But my gut tells me on the housing authority side, we're probably still two or three years away from really having the financial ability. And then how do we partner with the city on the housing authority side to bridge some of these gaps? Yes, but I thought Arlene's question was about neighborhoods that aren't assisted living or or uh, housing, like just 
you know, that's for Railer Park on 16th, or, um, you know, there's neighborhoods uh, on, in the Northeast. There's so many. There, there are places where few people have cars, and it would be good to have the Lester's, and I'll walk out with you because I have an idea about that. And, and part of the answer may be microtransit, too. We don't know. And I think if we had a chance to get through the microtransit RFP, that actually may be the solution. Because then if it's income based, and let's say it's 50 cents, you know, I think we need to get through that microtransit RFP because I do think the world's going to change dramatically once we get microtransit. Is microtransit going to be 24 7? Um, again, I don't know because I haven't had the RFP. I don't know that it'll be 24 7, but it, they're really, what we've seen is they're really in tuned into the, the life cycles of communities and understanding where people are going when. So it may not be 24 seven community wide, but they may have longer service hours, you know, let's say in the downtown because people tend to go there. So they evaluate all of that data. All right. I got seven minutes to wrap it up. Seven minutes to give the, give the hard sell here. Um, the senior center has a real problem right now, and it's really kind of critical in my opinion. And I think everybody around the table agrees, and maybe you know what I'm going to say, but that problem is wait time. We've got uh, roughly a four to five week wait time right now, and we got 180 people right now that have been on, I think, over more than about four weeks or so. We've got 90 people that have on uh, two weeks or less. For what? I'm yeah. sorry? Same, safe wait time, waiting, what are they waiting for? You didn't uh, say that. I'm sorry. For uh, an interview with the resource specialist. Oh. I've been thinking so much resource specialist, I didn't even think. But yeah, and that's a good subject. You know, all the problems that we've been talking about, you know, whether it's housing or transportation or all other kinds of problems, it kind of falls down on the resource specialist, you know, they're on the shoulders of the resource specialist. And I'm not going to give you a lot of figures that I don't have time, but uh, the number of clients, individual clients, from 2020 to 24 increased uh, from 832 to around 1,400. I mean, it's a, I mean, that's a 60, two-thirds, two-thirds increase, 60% increase. And so the amount of time that they spend on these interviews is just getting to be overwhelming. Now, I'm not, I don't have first-hand knowledge here, but I right. just, just from my observation and everything, the average um, number of people that the resource, I've just calculated that the average number of people <coughs> that the resource specialist see is about 528 in a year and uh, what they should what they were doing in 1980 was about 300 350 something like that so it's been a huge increase in the number of people that they see but the same number of resource specialists and so that that's why that's a, a major reason why you know, we have that wait time that we do and the number of contacts has increased this this is incredible the number of Contacts with those individuals has gone from two, uh, over 2,000 to about 3,400. Now, again, with the same staff. Mm -hmm. Well, you know where I'm going with this is uh, it, it clogs up everything. You know, the, if, the, if there's a cancellation or there's an emergency or something, that screws up the whole day right. for the resource specialist. And then on the, on the consumer side, the client, for example, they might get rescheduled and they go back to the Hawaiian because our house is been scheduled. And the, and the resource specialists don't have opening because they're both covered. So that's why I say there's a real problem here. And it all comes down on the heads of the resource specialists. So I put a pencil to this and I know what you're going to think. And I'm the first one really to talk about hard dollars here. But the board last time at our last meeting recommended that we have additional staff, resource specialists. 
and an administrative assistant. And I, I, you know, I know there's, I know, I know there's budget limitations. Yeah, I know that, and I know the city's under a lot of pressure for all this. I think, but I can't think, we can't think of another alternative right now. Right. Sure, there's certain efficacies that can be implemented, you know, certain efficiencies that can be implemented. But the problem is, it's just uh, too many people due to the population increase, the housing increase, you know, all of those kinds of things. And it, it is an issue, and I think everybody around the table agrees with that. So, the, 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 uh, the motion was that we have uh, two additional resource specialists, one bilingual, to address the problems that we're talking about in the administrative system. I put a pencil to it and entry level salary for those plus benefits of about 185 pay. And I, you know, that's that sounds like it a lot, but it isn't really in the whole scheme of things. But I'm just saying that's that's what what, what we see as the immediate big need. And the board will encourage Ronnie to put that in his budget. And that hopefully uh, you would be receptive to it. And we will follow this conversation up with the letter to the city council. And we will include that in our recommendations. And so I hopefully you've got the, the foundation, so to speak, the facts to support where we need staff the most. I mean, there's several needs, but that seems to be a real critical thing. Yeah, you know. Um as I'm looking back on the positions that we've recommended to council and with the brand unit for history, those t that tends to be where we've added positions. Yeah. In the within time within, the within the senior case. services because of everything that you just talked about. So I wish I could say that this was the only place that that's occurring. It's yeah, not. I, I mean, we're having the same issue in new services, slightly different tinge in terms of. You know, and I'll just talk to you about what we're seeing in these services. There's probably a more direct correlation into some of the crime issues that we've seen in our community recently. And so in the last year's budget process, we kind of focused on that. So what we had was a parent resource specialist. We had a rewind program manager. And that was really based on things that we weren't anticipating that occurred that occurred. But I will tell you in my mind, the resource specialists in terms of the request always tend to really get my attention in terms of a recommendation to council. You know, honestly, the council has had different communications from different folks on we want more programmers, we want more programmers. And, you know, when I've met with friends of, of the senior center, you know, I think that was the dominant conversation with programmers. And I'll tell you what I've said to them. If, if I'm given a choice and the need is resource specialists versus programmers, the recommendation that I'm gonna to make to the council all the time is the resource specialist because we've gotta be focused on people's health, safety, and well-being. And, and it creates an odd tension here. Yes. Because, you know, people want more programming. You know, I've talked to them that said, maybe we need to relook at how we do programming and do it almost on an income-based component because I'm pretty close to being able to, it's 55, right? Yep. So <laughs> I'm, three years, I'm, I'm three years away from being able to take advantage of programming here. I appreciate that. Can I squeeze another three or four minutes on here? Sure, here, sure. So what I will tell you is, you know, obviously that is front and center. Ronnie and Christina and everybody, they've been communicating this to me. You know, last budget, on the housing authority side, we adjusted the resource specialist there to actually fund it completely out of the housing authority to take some of the work off of the resource specialist at the senior center. We also funded the, the council approved via utilizing the marijuana tax to fund two clinicians um, via that. And then we also funded um, one clinician out of the housing authority again to maybe take some of the load off of the resource specialist. So while it wasn't directly here, it was designed to assist it, and they're all working together. That person wasn't bilingual, though. No. And so, 
And that, that's front and center in our minds too, because we also know the demographics are changing. So what I'll tell you for me is in many ways you're preaching to the choir based on what they have been communicating to me. And, you know, at the end of the day for us, it just, you know, so when we go into budget, and I've said this before, you know, you take salary increases off, you take must pay bills off, you take benefits off, and then you get to what inherently have left over to deal with. But um, those areas are front and center in my mind because there's an, an additional cost that we start incurring as a community if you don't have those services in place. And so you know a little bit of the work that we're doing, Christina has convened everybody that's providing mental health services in the city so that for the first time since I've been here, we've been trying this for how 12 years to do this. First time we've ever really been able to do it. So everybody providing mental health services are now working with each other. So instead of us working in silos, whether it's police or it's youth services, they're working collectively. So how can we take advantage of an economy of scale? And that work is really setting us up to make some of these other decisions and, and strategically doing it, but definitely hear it. Yeah. And I see the work that they're doing and I see how it's taxing them and it's growing. And, and so, yeah, that's not lost on me. Yeah. Oh, thank you. What I, need, what I need help on is when we do make the decisions to say, we're gonna fund a resource specialist. And I think what council needs help on I don't want to speak for them, but when we're making these decisions and then we're getting just blasted because, well, we didn't fill a programming position, I think the more that you all can help others understand that, you know, have to, need to, want to, that would help us a lot because I think there's a, yeah. an inherent tension in that. Okay. I, this is... What I'm about to say is not, not endorsed by the board, it's just basically me thinking, but I think a lot of them agree with it. And that is, you know, you talked about equity uh, in your opening statement. And that's what that's my top issue, quite frankly, across the board. And I think it would help as far as us justifying whatever it is that we're asking for, if we had a lot more hard data than we do. Because I think most of the council members do look at hard data. The problem is right now we don't have a lot of hard data. Now we do have, we do have a lot of reports. We have a lot of anecdotal kind of stuff, but we don't really have any hard data. So I guess what I'm getting at here is I wanted to know if you support, if you agree with the whole idea of, of, of uh, uh, more comprehensive data collection. Now, for example, what I'm getting at, getting back to the idea of equity, I think we need to pay more attention to specific demographic groups. For example, I'm just making this up, but uh, Hispanic veterans, uh, or people over five, with, uh, 85 with a disability. I mean, you can go on and on as far as different kind of uh, demographic groups. But I don't think we, you know, we, we know there's needs out there. That's not the problem. But we don't know the extent to which we should allocate our, our services, not so much the programs, in my mind, but the services, like we've been talking about, to different segments of the community to make it fair. And so I guess I'm wondering, and you always have problems of you know, uh, ethnicity, you know, sex, and Level, all that kind of thing, a lot of people in the same way. And some people say that that interferes with the relationships or the services that are provided. And that's true too. But I guess I'm, do you have a position or a philosophy or a point of view on that that would help us? So I would say preach. Um, so here's what we've done. Um, we, a few years ago, um, applied to be part of the Bloomberg What Work Cities, which is about data informed decision making and those issues. Now, I will say that data is important, but there's also things, you know, I talked to staff about data is not the end all be all. It's important, but you know, in many of the things that we do, there's an art form to it as well. 
and that's the experience that these folks bring into play. So we went through that program. As part of that, what we did organizationally, and, and there was a situation where we had haves and have-nots. And what I mean by that is our enterprise fund had more capacity in terms of doing that type of work just because they have a budget to do it. And uh, Becky Doyle was leading, leading that initiative. We restructured recently and I moved Becky's division and it's called strategic integration. So they are leading um, what we call Slay and the Data Dragon. Um, and so we have created um, different processes for data sharing. To give you a sense of how rooted some of the things were, I had different departments going, I don't want, you, you can't have access to my data. And I had to slide in <coughs> and go, you, you don't own the data, utility billing department. I have management of the data. And, and so it took us a while to get through now where all the data is going to go into is the data warehouse. Now obviously HIPAA related issues and things like that will be protected, but the data is going to go into the data warehouse to allow us to do that. So when we talk about Salesforce, that's part of that piece. So anyway, I, we moved strategic, to strategic integration out of the utilities and moved it into internal services. And internal services is a group in our organization that supports the entire organization. And we have been putting positions in there uh, via split funding to do that type of work so that we understand the data. Um, how do we create dashboards for the city council? that says, here's what we're doing. How do you give me a dashboard where I can see what's going on operationally? Mine's gonna be much more robust than probably anyone else's where I mean, I can dig down to granular level if I see it, anything. As part of the work that we're doing in terms of project management, and project management's bigger than just capital. Project management is something that we're working on just in our daily work. Um, where it, when it's fully built out, there will be alerts that are created in the system for me. So we can then set targets to say the wait period for resource specialists is two weeks, just theoretically. If that wait list starts getting out to three weeks, I may get a yellow alert. Christina will get however she wants it or Ronnie wants it, you know, we'll tear it gets out to four weeks, you can create a red alert, and that's gonna give us more immediate information in what we're doing. Um, and, and so, to the point in this, we have put resources in, we're bringing the right folks in to assist everybody in doing this work, uh, because I will tell you, when I look at the group here, they've never had that assistance, historically. And now we have the assistance. And to give you an example of what Jeff and I talked about, I don't want to know how many people go into the rec center. I want to know how many people go into the rec center and use a swimming facility, how many use the gyms, how many use the programs, because aggregate data tells me nothing. And that's going to start forming decision making where we can go to the council and say, these five programs are being utilized. We need to adjust. Right now, you're right, it's all anecdotal. When a lot of it is anecdotal when we're making these decisions. So, um, and I know Councilmember Martin and others have really been pushing for this, but it's a it's a resetting of the overall system. But absolutely, we need to have that because we need to make data informed decisions. Um, and the lesson for this board is going to be going forward, and I've already learned this lesson, if you think you need information about something, ask first, because the city may already have it, and you just have to, are the first person to ask the question. And, and that's a focus of our department um, in our three service areas, and so Ronnie can talk a little bit more um, as we move forward, kind of how we're gonna tackle that in our department retreat, and kind of the, the work around that, and to Council Member Martin's point, 
um, you know, we might already have some of that or might already be collecting some of that or it might be on the horizon, um, you know, as we move into this good partner work. And we'll be partnering with strategic integrations and make sure that, that we have and part of it is what I would say is, and, and that, as you evolve and as you change, things change. And so, by no means do I want this to come across as disparaging to any individual. But one of the things that I've seen, especially here, is that so much of the work was done and it was on paper, or it was on a separate spreadsheet, or and, and so it was virtually impossible to, to really do the data analytics work you needed to because it just wasn't in a form that you could do that, take it up and start evaluating. And so many of the things that Ronnie's been working on is really creating the base infrastructure that we need here. And it's not just here. I mean, we've seen it in other places, but I use it here because we've had these conversations. It's everything, you know, we just didn't have the techno technological ability because of everything I just talked about to really slide into that where we have the data we need. And, and, and I will say that's, I think, been part of the challenges that Brandy faced and Ronnie is, is really moving into this where we move out of paper and basic spreadsheets into a system that can work and I actually think Salesforce is probably going to be the bridge to where we can move into that direction and you know when it's fully implemented our, our, we will be able to connect an individual from senior services to rec center to next slide to utility building to all of these issues so that then we can proactively if Brandy's dealing with someone that's struggling with financial issues, we'll be able to proactively make sure they're in programs and, and understand what people are using. And so it, it it's really gonna help us with the well-being of an individual. Part of what's coming out of Salesforce to the data piece is we've talked about enabling caring communities and we started this work six years ago. We knew inherently that we were not connecting as an organization around people that were serving. Um, I know there were clients they were dealing with, that they were struggling with, that weren't necessarily getting the services they needed because other departments were facilitating behaviors. So we had a client that probably needed to be in memory care. You probably know exactly who I'm talking about. A lot of them. But, but, <laughs> but Michelle and I, I mean, it was just pure accident that people connected on this. What we ended up finding out was that that individual was calling the fire department to change batteries and do other stuff. They were also putting the laundry into the dryer and doing other things. And so what happened was that we had a completely different department that was facilitating the behavior that wasn't allowing that person to get into a memory care facility. So nothing existed six years ago. But we did meet with the fire department on the you did. record. You did. <laughs> you did. But it was, you know, it was, it was, it was the human intelligence and a sheer. I think mean, we just happened to see each other at, at a location and talk about it. I can give you a hundred other examples of that occurring. So nothing existed six years ago, so we started working with the University of Colorado School of Health and others to say, how do we do this enabling caring communities? It's essentially a middleware that connects us organizationally. Um, fast forward to today, when we brought Salesforce in, we started noodling around it, and they have built that platform up. So we're in conversations now with Salesforce and operationalizing it. What would that allow us to do? And, and, and if we can have, if we have the money to do it. Don't look at me, I could pay my taxes. <laughs> well, I may, I may come to council, but we probably want to test it in the housing authority world first, because what it lets us do is it lets people opt in. So you, you don't mind me picking up. That's okay. <laughs> so a resident, you could opt into it to say, 
here's all this information about me. If you had a caregiver, you could go, here's my primary caregiver, here's their name. If you had a secondary. And then if anything were ever to happen, we would, the police department and fire department would have the information necessary. So welfare checks are horrible issue for us now because of federal laws that we have to deal with. We can't just go in anymore. But if you gave us permission, then they could just go in. It would then start notifying everyone. So if Brandy was your caseworker and fire department transported, then all of a sudden it alerts Brandy to an issue. You can alert the caregiver. And so it starts connecting everyone organizationally around the individual. Um, and it fast. Yeah. Much faster. So you're, you're eliminating the human intelligence and you're utilizing artificial intelligence to, to serve the individual at, at a much higher level. If the individual doesn't opt in, it still gives us the ability. So let's say somebody comes in with, and I had this happen. Someone with mental health issues came into our office and was really having some struggles. It happened that there was somebody that worked three offices down that knew the person. So they were able to call the individual's mom. But for that, we're probably in a much different way of how we're dealing with it and calling public safety lead for because we don't know. It would give us the ability to type the individual's name in. I may know nothing other than there's an alert that says call Brandy Queen. And I can go, Brandy, I put this person's name in, here's what's going on. And Brandy could go, I got it. Or here's what we need to do. Um, and so it's streamlining it. So to your point on data and all of this, we're slowly sliding into this world um, it's organizationally, it's a challenge, though. I can say that. Yeah. I know enough about it to understand it, not to do much about it. Yeah. Arlene, yeah. Yeah. So, I just have a question for just the chuckle, and it's probably just a yes or no answer. Um, as we are bringing new businesses into the community, of, of the larger businesses that we bring in, are we saying to them, do you have the ability to provide an ECE center in your facility to accommodate your people who are working for you? We have not done that on the business side. Where we have done that, though, is through work with um, our permanent supportive housing. So um, we're currently um, working with the Colorado Health Foundation um, to co-locate uh, early childhood centers um, as uh, LJ expands. Um, and so we're going to pilot that out, um, but to my knowledge, that has not um, uh, technically been done with any with any businesses. But that is a good a good thing to, to follow up on. So in Christina's world, no. In the economic development world, yes, we're starting to see that. So businesses are communicating into a system mm -hmm. that says we need it and. I know they're starting to work with each other and how we do it. So we're partnering with TLC on oh, right. on an early child care center and money that the council's allocated. Right. Businesses have also come together on that, and um, I believe it's UC Health and Smuckers that are okay. engaged in that. But it's a different right. portal. But again, right. that's areas we need to kind of streamline to make sure that she's aware of it. But and so what we have done on the early childhood side, though, is map. Um, through uh, kind of the connection that Harold talked about with what work cities, we have um, looked at a dashboard and worked with consultants to map um, where child care deserts um, uh, are located within our, our community. And so, um, you know, if it's, if it's building capacity with a certain child care center that needs to expand or how we work with TLC, that's kind of how we're, we're involved at that level. Yes, sir. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to like asking a question that'll probably take an hour, but I'm gonna squish it into 30 seconds. Um, as, as seniors, um, you know, they want to maximize as much income as they can, and they, as they get seniors, there's only a few things that they can do. Um, one of them would be the Homestead Act. Um, the current rule is you have to be in that property for 10 years. 
well, if you sell your property and then move into a, another house, they buy, well, then you have to wait another 10 years before you can get the Homestead Act. So I was hoping that the Homestead Act throw away the 10 years, and if you're 65 and older, then you can qualify for the tax deduction. Um, so that's one way they can get some income and spend it on transportation or food or whatever they need. Uh, the other one would be property tax and loan levies. Um, you know, the senior's been here for 30 some years, they've been paying property taxes and no levies for that long of a time. And now that they're seniors, do they still need to get that 30, you know, 30% increase or 20% increase on no levies? Um, they've been paying for many, many years. So I think that should be eliminated and only have it for uh, Jerome Powell that says we only want inflation to be 2%. two percent. So I think there should only be a 2% increase on that. And that was what I think the answer would be. And also on Social Security, I think there's only five states that have to pay, um, seniors have to pay taxes. And unfortunately, Colorado is one of them. So I was hoping that there'd be some new bill that will eliminate uh, Social Security taxes for seniors here in Colorado. So. Most of the, or almost everything is state or federal. So in terms of how we we interplay with that, the council will take positions on bills that are coming forward. I will say as part of the housing issue generally, I know there were some conversations about the Homestead Act and in that 10 year issue because part of the challenge with this creating the housing issue for us is because of the cost of housing. You know, the state's talking about this. One of the things that is um, uh, creating issues with supply is because of the house cost of housing older adults aren't selling their house in the way that they used to and then you add the homestead component to it and then they lose the tax exemption they're staying in their homes and so what that's doing is is that's reducing the natural supply that occurs typically in a housing market which is then also artificially raising the cost of housing because you don't have the natural turn in homes. So I know that I've been in a couple of presentations where they're talking about it, but in terms of what they do, um, I'm not sure, but when those bills do come forward, the council does engage and support those. But that's all we got. That's all we got. I mean, I would take those issues and talk to our state legislators about them. Anything else for Harold? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was last year. No problem. Anytime. Okay, next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, and I'll say this about Ronnie. I mean, honestly, I've probably spoken to you all more than I have in the time I've been here, and that's because they're bringing me in. You know, I tell staff, let me know when you want to come in, and they're bringing me in, and so. Uh, some people take advantage of it, some people don't, but what I wanted you all to know that Ronnie's definitely one that's like, I need you in to talk about this. And it's like, all right, let's get scheduled. And I think we've done it two or three times in the last week, or in the last month. I know we've done it a lot. I've seen him more in the last month. So, you know, just communicate with Ronnie. He does a great job of funneling things up and um, well, definitely getting a different view of things. Yeah, we communicate a great thing sometimes as well. So. Good thing. All right. All right. Well, thank you. So thank you. Thank you for the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a breakfast. Okay. Yeah. Those I that had this and an energy drink. All right. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Um, Ronnie? Yep. Uh, is there anything that you did? Can you put your report off until Yes, fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, in that case, I will just say. Can we just have a minute or two? <laughs> or you know, I need to go there. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we needed a bathroom break. Oh. Okay. Well. Uh, <laughs> I, I can I can tell them uh, later. This is only. Uh, um, the next, uh, the next meeting, we're going to have a friend, Chuck. That's his last name. Bueller. Bueller. Okay, Chuck Bueller is going to be here. 
and he'll, uh, I asked him to come in and just, uh, we've had a couple of people on the board say, you know, we'd like to know more about Clint. And so that's why we're coming. And uh, I don't know how long that'll be. I'm guessing maybe for a couple minutes. You laugh. I do. <laughs> okay. And then the other thing is, um, you heard what Lonnie was saying, and Sheila has said, and uh, uh, Art, uh, myself, uh, and Arlene, about reports. And that's how we handled it last year. We had two people committees, so to speak. And I'd like to do that again. Uh, in some new areas, we're not going to forget about housing and transportation, but we need to move on to some other areas. And so, for the new people on the, on the board, I would suggest that uh, you pick from one of these. You can name them yourself, but just to refresh your memory. Mental health turns out the way. So I don't know if anybody is going to grab onto that one. And substance abuse. It could be the same, handled by the same or two separate. But mental health and substance abuse. Caregiving, that came up again today. Uh, financial employment. Uh, legal. Food assistance, home services, veterans, safety, you know, all of those are issues that we can uh, look into. And we can talk more about that at our next meeting. Uh, one that I am particularly interested in is the climate change and how that impacts policy, how it impacts services to seniors, heat mitigation, for example. That might be something I do. Anyway, those are all areas. Think about it. And you all have your own interests and your uh, expertise, and uh, hopefully you can do something um, in those areas uh, next year. So and next year, this time we'll do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you sent us an email, and I think you only listed three of the uh, seventeen that you listed. Oh, did I? <laughs> can, you, can you just send us a thing? Oh, sure. All of them on the list. Yeah, I can. I will. Okay. Sure. I'll send you a reminder in a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, John. Harold mentioned Urban Child Care is one of the three on his map, map there. Child care. Yeah. yeah. Is that Child something care, seniors care. that we would address, or is it appropriate for us to look at that? Sure. I think you can combine that with adult daycare. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Put it on my list. We know lots of grandparents who care for their grandchildren. Yes, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So with the um, information that you've given us and you're asking for additional reports and stuff, are we going to have to be extending this meeting to three hours, which would mean start at nine instead of 10 and go to 12? Because we consistently <laughs> put well, everything to go. Yeah, I mean, that's just, I'm just throwing that out. That I, We don't have to decide it now, but I'm just wondering if that's something that we're going to eventually get to. Are you you're serious? Uh -huh. Yeah, but I think it's something that, yeah. Okay. Because we don't ever get through any, almost never get through any of this stuff. Well, maybe if we put too much on the agenda. Well, that's something we can talk about. Oh, you heard it. Uh, maybe you didn't hear it, Art. She was just suggesting maybe we should have three hour meetings. Mm -hmm. you know, I think the three hour meetings, because we have a tough time. We always have uh, getting through our, our agenda in two hours. Oh, I agree. I mean, we need an increase out of it for three hours. Okay. But I think we should increase it a little bit. Let's, but I would like to see how the others do yeah. too. And that's think about it. Maybe we can get to talk about that. I think we need to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, right. You know, the, when, you, when you talk about complicated issues, it takes time to think it through. So, yeah, maybe you're right. Okay, anything else? Yes, sir. I just want to make you mention substance abuse. Uh, I'm not having my best tenants who access to substance abuse. And uh, we're following all the rules. We want to close all the gaps. Um, sending you to jail. And the answer is very different. Um, one, you know, tenant is a high person. Senior, it's about so it's a lot of so on about um, But uh, the kid, a lot of times they're managing that they don't care, doesn't that? 
So they bought it, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. So they just get the grocery to somebody who had eaten. Okay, you need to go get that spot so we can get that better. And we need to grow to this better people and help them. Um, the problem is addiction. And, and one thing that I saw was that um, there was some like brain surgery, the possibility that they find that damaged nerve in the brain. And then it can, the brain surgery would be trapping that spot. Thank you. Yeah. So, we've got a lot of I don't think you're much about the addiction. Thank you. Uh, we couldn't hear what was being said. Sorry. Can you sum it up? And, uh, we sum so it, was, it was more uh, people who had drug addiction. What? People who had drug addiction. Right. And, you know, what's the answer? Um, right now, the therapy would be, you know, that person has to be on Suboxone or uh, methadone. But methadone, my understanding that the person has to go pick up methadone once a day. And Suboxone, they'd have to get a prescription maybe once a week. But most people who are addicted, doesn't matter, don't care. They don't do nothing. But maybe somebody can manage them and take them, you know, you, let's go pick up your meds. And maybe there's some clinics that they can go to that get some therapy. But I think they need somebody to help them. But of course, a lot of times their answer is, they don't want to do nothing. So, you know, they just get addicted. But the other part of it is there might be some type of a brain surgery. Um, it's like more of an echo sound instead of, you know, breaking up the brain. But that's a new, um, it, it's an experiment that's in another state. And that's the only thing they, you know, there's a damaged piece of brain, they zap it, and then it's no longer damaged. And then that addiction is gone. But it's an experiment, it doesn't, uh, it isn't 100%, but maybe 80% of people do pass. So um, I think that I like to see that looked at, maybe bring a specialist to Colorado or transfer, you know, give somebody a plane trip over to West Virginia. But that's the only solution that I've seen, some new ideas, but right now there's not a lot of answers. I don't see a lot of answers. It's just let them overdose and die. Well, you pick up a good issue. It's a difficult one. Yeah, and I think that uh, it's not going to be an issue. It's not an uh, issue. It's not going to be an issue. I don't know what, what area you're talking about. What age we're, 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 we're looking at here. Still a problem. It's not yeah, it's all. It is. I think we need we need to be educated. But, uh, yeah. Most of us are. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to ask for a, a motion to adjourn. Move. <laughs> okay, and one second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed.